It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's Bench Talk 101. Um, tonight's um, speaker um, has joined us for a, a, as far as I can remember now um, and is one of our regulars on, on Bench Talk. Um, his talk's going to be on boring tools, uh, and that's the last pun we'll have on that. Uh, not boring at all. Um, he, I kind of struggled a little bit with an intro. I thought, how do I actually introduce Sean? Um, and he actually gave me the words which I thought suited it perfectly. So what he said is that he is a software developer by day, a wood molester, a wood molester by night, and someone who likes to fiddle with his bits. And I think we're about to see that evidence first person here. So we're all going to get to see him fiddle with his bits live on screen. Um, can't wait for that. Um, I'm now going to spotlight Sean and over to you. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, I've brought quite a few bits, a little bit. I doubt we'll get through absolutely everything here tonight. But my bench right now is absolutely covered. Nothing bits and various things that can go on a brace. So I'd like to start off by saying I don't really consider myself an expert on these things. Um, I'm more of an enthusiast. I'm, I'm looking forward to the q and I'm pretty sure I'm going to learn as much as I impart tonight. Um, what I'm going to try and do is introduce people who are completely unfamiliar with braces and bits um, to the main types of bits, explain how they work, why they're designed the way they're designed, what to look out for, how to sharpen them. And then I'm going to try and go through some of the less normal bits and explain why they're useful and why they're not just junk and you should probably sharpen them up and take them for a spin. So at any delay, let's get into the pretty much the standard augers. So these are the two you're most likely to encounter. Jennings pattern, sorry, Jennings pattern and Irwin pattern. The Irwins have a solid core running up the center, so they're easy to spot. The Jennings have a double twist. Um, really, the difference between these is, to me, academic. Most of the jobs I do, it doesn't really matter. This is the later invention. And the idea is by having this solid core, you have a stronger bit, you have more space for shavings to escape. So it's less likely to jam and clog and wet pitchy wood or anything like that. So let's start at the tip of these and work their way down. They're quite a refined tool. They've been around for a long time. This is sort of almost the end stage of development and hand-powered drill bits. So I'm just gonna fire up the second camera that's gonna let me zoom in on these guys a little bit. Give me one moment. Okay, here we go. So, First part, we'll work from the, the top down or the bottom up, depending on which way you want to look at it. You've got the snail, this little treaded portion here. Now its job is to pull the bit through the wood as you cut, but a treaded bit, you don't actually have to exert downward force on the brace as you drill. Once this has bitten, it will pull the bit down and you only have to apply rotational force. You can see this bit here is not in good shape. The treads are mangled and battered. That is not going to do a good job. The second thing that's worth knowing about the tread is not every bit has the same TPI on it. The coarser the tread, the faster it's going to pull itself through the wood. If you're going to try and bore a really hard wood, you don't want a coarse tread. You want a fine tread. Um, a medium tread, if you go slow and careful, will generally work with just about anything. You might be looking at these and thinking these, this one is fine and this one is coarse. That's not actually true. These are probably roughly equivalent. And the reason is on most of the Jennings pattern ones with the double twist, they're double treaded. So there's two treads for every one on this. They'll actually move at about the same rate. So if you compare the two of these and go, I'll go with this because it's finer, you're probably making a mistake. You're looking for either a Jennings bit that looks finer than the others or an Irwin bit that looks finer than the others. The manufacturers made them in various different um, TPI for different applications. They usually had a fine and medium and a coarse. After that, you get to these flip, you get, sorry, to the wings. These little things that stick out on the side over here. Their job is to cut a hole. Um, sorry, it's to sever the fibers around the hole so you get a clean entry hole. So I'm going to show them going to work right now with another bit. Switch back here for a second. 
so I'm lucky enough that I recently got some new old stock Marple Shamrock brand bits. These have actually never touched wood before tonight. They're still sitting here in the wrapping and the anti-rust paper. You'll get to see exactly what, or as close as you can get to a brand new bit out of the box can do. Grab a brace. Chuck this guy up. And we'll go back to our close-up camera now and we'll see exactly how the mechanics of this work. Shift this light back a bit, so or it's going to interfere with the swing of the brace. One moment. So as I start to drill, you can see the snail begin to grab, dig in. And after a moment, those wings make contact. I'll just zoom in a little bit. As you can see, there's a perfectly scribed little circle there. And that's what gives these bits a really clean entry hole. The cutter isn't actually in contact with the wood yet. It's hovering off it still. The snail hasn't gone all the way down. So by the time this starts lifting fibers, the borders have already been severed. It's just lifting it up and flipping it out. So you can see, you should see some nice curls coming up in a second. There we go. I'm going to take this all the way through now, and I'm going to show you the exit hole. So, switch back in for a moment. And you can see here that the far side is not a pretty sight. It's completely beaten the hell out of it. That's one of the downsides of these bits. What you can do, just back this camera back a little bit. Just to point exactly where I want to put the second. I need to focus, Sean. Yeah, sorry. It's just as I was moving the camera around the phone, decided to switch to a different application. There we go. What you can do. Drive your brace in. Tighten up a little bit. And you can just see the tip of the snail has just come around here. So I'll back out. Flip it back down. Over. Sorry, I'm getting a mirrored view, so it gets a bit confusing as you try and get the right camera angle. There we go. And if I just drop the tip into that little hole we saw. And right now you can see why that spiral shape exists. If this was a deeper hole all the way down, it would lift the shavings right up and carry them out so the blade wasn't clogging. And there we go. And as you can see, that's a much prettier exit hole that we have to work with. So in the day of a hand power drill, why would you bother with these things? Um, for starters, they are, um, it's very easy to stop before something goes wrong. Uh, when you're drilling with these, you don't go and then have a board flip out of the way because it wasn't held down properly. Mistakes tend to be small. 
if you're trying for a very exact depth of hole or anything else, you're going slow enough that you're not likely to overshoot. Very hard to drill large holes with a hand-powered battery drill. They don't really have the torque to handle bits like this. But um, to get back to the specifics of these guys, when you're buying them, you're probably going to see a set that looks, if you get a whole set, which you don't really have to do, you'll see something like the, these guys over here. That's a set of double twist bits. They generally start at a quarter inch and they'll go up to an inch in a standard set. Um, so if you see on the tang of one of these, let's see. Right. You will be. No. There we go. You should see a little sixteen printed just underneath my thumb. But you'll see it usually marked right down there under the tank. Sometimes it'll be on the shaft as well. You can get smaller bits than that. Um, I have a 3 16th bit around here somewhere, but really you don't want them. You want to go get yourself an egg beater um, and use a broad point when you're getting that small. The 3 16th bits don't show up very often because they're so terribly fragile. Um, I have a few 4 16th bits that are like noticeably bent because it's easy to impart that much force with a brace. The 3 16th bits just didn't survive. They go up to about two inches. But anything over an inch in size was usually bought one at a time. It wasn't bought as part of a standard set. Um, I very rarely see anything over an inch and a half in size. I'm generally going to be demonstrating the largest bits that I've got tonight because they'll show up easier on the camera. This, for example, that I just showed you is a one and an eight inch bit. Um, the What else is worth saying about these guys? The sizes. So they're in sixteenths. They're usually oversized. If you, uh, they're usually about a 64th of an inch bigger than the stated size. So most of these weren't fine woodworking tools or cabinet makers tools. Most of these were used for drilling holes for cabling housing. These were job site tools. Um, so if you were trying to drill a hole for a cable or a pipe, being that little bit oversized was actually useful. If you actually look in the old Irwin catalogs, they state we make these 164 oversized. So if it's important to you that you have exactly the an exact precise size, you want a specialist type of bit. You want what's called a dowling bit. Now I don't have any of these with a brace shank. But I do have some augers with a round shank. And if I hold these up beside a normal brace bit, you'll see the difference immediately. These are generally quite short and stubby. They're about half the size of a standard brace bit. These were precision machined. If this says a quarter inch, then it's a quarter inch. So if that's important to you, dowling bits are what you want. The bad news is it's hard to find dowling bits. And it's not even necessarily true that if you see a short stubby bit, it's a dowling bit. It might just be a short bit. Um, I have hundreds of brace bits in my collection. And when I went to give this talk, I realized I had no dowling bits at all when I checked the ones I had. And um, the real lesson is get out of calipers. If it's really important to you that your hole is an absolute perfect size, get out the calipers and check them. Um, this style, the double twist, was generally favored by the cabinet makers because you had more surface in contact with the side of the hole. So it was um, harder to deviate in that respect. But I'm going to switch now to a second type of bit that people see a lot, um, but I'm actually quite fond of. I think they're really, really useful. So that's the center bit. You guys have probably seen these in lots of old tools all over the place. And it's an earlier design than the twist auger. But right up to the 1960s, you could buy a roll of these brand new from the same catalog where you bought your twist auger. They have advantages over the standard bit. And um, the first advantage slash, slash disadvantage, I'll switch over so I can give you some close ups on this guy. The first advantage slash disadvantage is there's no snail. It's just a point. You might wonder why that's an advantage. And um, the disadvantage is these are going to be slower to start. They're, they cut very, the nice thing is if it's sharpened properly, it actually does 
cut, it's not a wedge. So just like this birdcage all that I've been using to point stuff out, if it's sharpened properly, the sides actually sever fibers. They're not just forcing them apart. The snail on a Jennings bit is a wedge as far as wood is concerned. So if you're working close to the edge of a board, this will often split it. This will cut through and keep going. The second thing is this spike on the side is, um, is the equivalent of the wing on the Jennings bit. It scores the hole before we go through. But you'll notice I've got two cutters on my standard auger, one on each side. I've only got one on this guy. That's both an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is it cuts slower. It's only lifting one part of the hole at a time. The advantage is you're only pushing a cutter that's half the width. So while I said the biggest augers I've seen um, are about two inches, here's a two and a half inch center bit, and it works. You want a large brace to push it. You're not gonna be doing, uh, I have, a 14 inch brace is the largest I have, um, and you want it for operating something like this, but it's still quite doable. Um, I've cut test holes with this and it works just fine. It's very slow to start because you've quite a distance to get down with that tip, but once it gets in, it actually cuts quite quickly. So you can cut a much larger hole, you can cut close to the edge, and you can drill thinner material with these guys than you can with a standard order. The big disadvantage is it's slower, and there's no surface in contact with the side of the hole like there is with this guy. Once you're down, it's very easy to wander and wallow out your hole. So they're not great for big deep holes. The other thing is these guys, because of that snail, can get stuck in end grain quite easily. This guy will go very slowly in end grain, but it will go. If you're patient, you can still get the job done. That's what actually got me onto these guys. I wanted to drill end grain holes into some handles I was making. I kept splitting them apart with standard augers and I cut them onto these guys. So let me grab this guy, I'll give you another quick demonstration of the cutting action. No butter going all the way through this time, but the same rule applies as applies with the um, as applies with the auger. You don't want to go all the way through, it will not make a pretty exit hole. So let's see. Let's move this board down a little bit rather than playing with the camera. Hang on. So then again, you can see that tip goes in, the wing scores, and now with this I have to apply downward pressure. There's no snail pulling me through. I've started right beside a knot there, making my life difficult, but as you can see, true I go, and it's not doing too slow a job at all. Um, what I'll do for a second is I'm going to grab a little thin piece of wood and clamp it down here. This guy does not have a lot of width to it. Let's grab this and drill in a little bit over here. And my clamp is, of course, in the way of my camera. Let's just do it. And we'll see. Oh, one clamp is not enough. I'm just going to drill this quickly and show it. Oh, no. Okay, I'm not going to waste any more time with that. I don't have a good time to set up here for a thin piece of wood. But if you go slow and careful with one of these bits, you can usually get through a thin piece without splitting it. The auger will just destroy it. It'll wedge it in two. I've had pieces of wood an inch thick and an inch wide just explode when a large auger tip has gone into it. There's my first test piece here. So I'm going to double back to the standard augers for a moment. And most of what I'm going to say about them will be true for everything else. So if you're looking to get secondhand ones, not new old stock, what should you be looking out for? And the first thing is, if you're going to be using augers, you need an auger bit file. Well, you can get away with other things, but really, this guy is the right tool for the job. So it has two cutting faces on one end, but safe sides. 
and two cutting sides with safe faces on the other. And that'll become quite obvious when I show you a bit, I show you how you would uh, go about touching it up. So when it comes to a bit like this guy, actually I'm not gonna use that, that's my new bit that I've just taken out. You would take your bit. I usually do literally what I'm showing you right now. I stick the tread against a piece of wood and then you, that's the safe one, find your cutting face and just run it a couple of times. It's too shallow. See it brighten up, flip it over to the other side. Try and match the angle of the bevel that's already there. And that would be a typical cutter sharpening session from start to finish. Just a few quick swipes with the file. The second thing you want to make sure, sure is sharp is that wing. It tends to be, it's not flat on the inside. It tends to be slightly curved across the inside. So I would just literally yet again grab it and just run that cutting face. Two or three swipes. Once I'm seeing it's bright at the edge, sorry, I can't slide the other camera. Very, just slightly, an up, slight up and over movement to allow for that curve in it. And the same on the other side. And that would be it. And this, if you can see it, is why the safe faces are important. I'd be cutting down into my cutting edge right here if this file had a face there when I was doing that job. And I'd be cutting into the side of my wing or my flutes or my tread or my snail if I was doing it from the other side. So you need, you need something with safe edges. You can get away with small bits of wood with sandpaper glued to them or diamond files. But particularly when you get to the smaller sizes of auger, having those cutting narrow cutting edges is really valuable. The next part you might consider fixing up is the snail. Generally speaking, um, a bad snail is a bit of a lost cause. If the tip is broken off, you can file a new tip on, but it's probably never gonna work very well. If you have one that's essentially in good shape, um, what I like to do to clean it up, if it's got gunk and it's getting jammed, is I take the bit, my brace. I put it in a, in a brace. I turn it so that the snail cuts almost all the way down. I don't want the blades to start cutting. Back it out. And then I take a little bit of abrasive paste. This stuff has uh, absolutely, oh no, that's the, that'll do. This is a diamond paste. I usually use a different one called Smurf Poo. It's a delightful name. I just pack it over that hole, fill it up. And then just work the tip in and out a few times treading in the hole pushes it against it and if you have any minor deformations or burrs or bits of stubborn wood that won't come out in and out a few times and that generally does a good job of cleaning it if you have something really stubborn in there and you need to get it out a file card is a great tool to just whack over the treads it won't beat them up it won't damage them it'll keep them going the golden rule when you're sharpening these is don't go near the outside. If you go near the outside, over time, you will destroy your bit. So if you sharpen the outside of the wings, sorry, if you sharpen the outside of the wings, over time, the tip of your bit is gonna get smaller and smaller. And as it goes past that, the body will jam and that's it, you're hosed. You don't really wanna mess with the geometry on this side of the cutter either um, it will mess it up if it sinks low then the tr the the, um, the tread isn't going to match up with the cutting face and stuff will jam in there and it will feed bits of wood that it can't cope with in a lot of the time people think that the snail on their bit is um is no good because they keep pulling their bit out because it's jammed and finding it stuffed full of tin sawdust but often that's the symptom, not the problem. The problem is just that the cutters aren't sharp enough. 
And when they stop being sharp enough, they're not producing shavings, they're producing dust. The dust gathers in the bottom of the hole, it works its way into the treads in the snail, and the snail stops being able to bite and your bit spins out and stops working. Um, so another thing we're pointing at is these things really are consumables. Um, an auger bit like this has a very definite shelf life. It can only be sharpened so many times and then it's gone. You know, there's only so many times you can run over a file over those wings before they're gone. There's only so many times you can sharpen the edge before you're too far back and you're too steep. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting to show is this is a good bit to demonstrate it with. I have one here I was looking at and I thought this bit is fantastic. It's got every problem the world knows in one bit. So if I switch back to our close up camera again. So if I take my new old stock bit and this compare them side by side. So let's get the angles right here so you guys can see what I'm trying to show. So first of all, if you look at those wings, you'll see this new old stock bit has considerably more depth than this guy. This guy spends less time scoring the hole and scores it less deeply, making it far more likely you're going to get tear in. Another thing that's good to see is the angle of the cutting edge. On a new bit, it's usually somewhere around, I'm just gonna point you here, so I'll take it out of focus. It's usually about 30 to 35 degrees down here. And you can see, sorry, you can see the cutting edge right there. If we look at this guy, the old one beside it, and you take a, a side profile on one side, you can see that the angle has been dramatically shallowed. And what that showed up as is a problem is if you look at the cutting edge on that side, you can see it's ragged because it got so shallow the bits of metal started breaking off. You can see that you can see that wave in the cutting edge where it's just lost metal in chunks. On the other side it has the opposite problem. That bevel has been taken too steep so it's just generating lots of dust. So I think if you're going to spend a lot of time working with these, it's worthwhile buying at least one new old stock bit because you can hold it up to one that's giving you problems and eyeball it and probably figure out what the problem is very fast. It's a lot of work to correct, to correct the bevel on one of these that's working badly, but it can be done. You've got the time and the patience, but usually you can get bits cheaply enough that unless you've got something kind of unusual, it's not worth it, just throw it away, go get another decent bit. Uh, what do we go to next? Um, let's look at the spoon bits. No, actually, let's go to the gadget and the cook bits. So, these guys. You'll see that unlike on the, these are called gadge or cook bits. Unlike the, um, the Jennings and the Irwins, there is no wing. Um, and they have this curved hook coming down off the side. And this cuts more like a gouge than a plane. It scoops the wood out. And then you have these guys, which are basically the same tool, but rather than just an arc coming out of the bottom, it's fully enclosed. They really have the same um, benefits. These are, sorry, this, the bull nose are a bit harder to find and they're a little bit stronger. These were called cook bits in the US and they are called gedge bits in the UK just because the guy in the US who invented them sold the patent to somebody else in the UK who lodged it, uh, who filed everything under his own name. So these have some advantages over, um, over the standard Irwin bit. The first is they work way better in end grain. That gouge type scooping action moves through the wood and pulls out end grain far better. Um, the second is because you've got no wing, you can go in at a dramatically shallower angle. So if I look at this guy, for example, once I start to tip the bit down, once the wing contacts, the snail lifts up. I can't go drill in at any shallower an angle, uh, shallower an angle than that. And even if I try and go in at that angle, the wing is gonna interfere in very short order. So if you wanna drill an angled hole, an acutely angled hole in particular, these aren't great for that. 
Um, these guys, on the other hand, have no wing. So while they can be more and more difficult to start as you depress the angle, they will actually do it. They'll go in there, they'll cut, they'll get the job done. These, this style of bit was also particularly, um, they do a little bit better, in, sorry, I'm holding the wrong one up. They do a little bit better when it comes to hitting knots and the like and not getting deflected. So they were quite popular um, for long deep holes. Um, I've got full sets of both. Basically for me, these are my go-to end grain boring tool. That's what I get a lot of use for these out of. If you're not gonna bore end grain a lot, it's probably not a huge amount of advantage because there's better bits if angled holes are what you're looking for. So when it comes to angled holes, pretty much, there's two types of bit which are pretty much king. Uh, and I'll go to, oh, one thing worth not noting with these. These on the other hand, are no good for sharpening with an over bit file. Um, it, it's, it's a straight file and you have a curved surface you want to sharpen. What you want to get is a small half round file. Any small half round file will do. Come in from the opposite side to the cutting edge, lift it, lift it in and run it around like that. They're actually quite easy to sharpen. A um, few revolutions and you're good. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Like the, once you figure that out, yet again, a dowel with a piece of sandpaper or something else would actually do the job just fine there. It's not an inferior tool at all. So little round or half round file in from the back, follow the rim and you're good. Now, spoon bits. These are wonderful. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And there's a lot of um, misidentification when it comes to these things. So, first of all, you often hear people say something like, this guy often gets listed on eBay as a spoon bit. That's not a spoon bit. That's a shell bit. Um, there is some difference in terminology between the US and the UK. I'm often not sure exactly what language to use to describe a bit like this. But some people say that if it's flat across the tip, it's a gouge bit and if it has a bit of a point like this guy or like this guy then it's a shell bit but the real question of is it a spoon bit or not my mental model for it is pretty simple could i hold some liquid in this you could you could literally eat some soup with this if you can use it as a spoon it's a spoon bit um the shell bits um are really dowling bits that was their main application um, these are quite easy to sharpen. Uh, the trick is that they're not flat across. There's a slight bevel on the sides. So you just take your auger bit file and run it all the way around the perimeter, try and match the existing uh, bevel as best you can. These do relatively good on deep holes. They do a good job of cutting straight, but because the whole side is a cutting surface, you can wander off. Um, Variants on this were popular for doweling in things like sash windows. I think Richard Arnold actually has an extraordinarily long set of these and a, and a jig for getting right in the center of the window parts. Um, I think I saw him post that on Instagram a while back and I was wildly jealous of them. Um, then you come to evolutions of that tool. You have the nose bit. So you can see huh? there's a little wing just on the tip of this. And it's kind of like a, a prototype snail. These cut a little better. They cut a little faster. Both types of bit are a nightmare to start accurate. You really want to get a gouge and start the hole with the gouge and drop it in the pre-made hole. They will wander like crazy if you put them across, um, if you just drop them down and try and drill. And then you get to actual spoon bits. Actually, sorry, one, one more variation of the shell before I do that, which is this guy, which actually did get a snail. Um, you don't see these very often. This is the worst drill bit I own. I'm tempted to try and use it to split a log. Every piece of wood I have tried to drill with this has split in two. The, the snail on it is very coarse. Um, it comes to quite a wide tip and it has taken out like, you know, two by two wood. I've tried to drill into it with this to see what would happen and it just explodes on contact. I don't really recommend these for anything. But um, these guys are kind of vintage shell bits. 
there's nothing wrong with them. They come in all shapes and sizes, but I'm gonna concentrate now on this, which is a new old stock Clico shell bit. And these are really fun. Um, first of all, they really don't care what angle you try and cut at. If I put my brace down. So, These are favored quite a bit by chair makers for a couple of their properties. First of all, chair makers tend to work on relatively small parts. So yet again, no lead screw, much dramatically um, reduced chance of the wood splitting. Uh, let me set this up for a close up again. Secondary camera a little bit. Focus. There we go. So you can see precise starting at the hole. You can watch that danced around a bit. Yet again, you want to get a gouge or something. But once it's in, it's in. And it really does not care what angle you try and drill at. It will just keep cutting. And one of the things this sometimes gets used for, you know, nice to break my, the ratchet on my brace. I have. What joy. Um, one of the things this sometimes gets used for is it gets used for wallowing out the hole. So you go in a certain depth and then you lean left, lean right, lean front, lean back, and you can make the bottom of the hole bigger than the entrance of the hole. Then if you take a dried chair part and force that tenon in, as it begins to reabsorb moisture, it'll swell up and kind of provide a ball joint inside. Um, so. The other thing is because there's no huge difference here between the tip of the cutting bit and the uh, the rest of the body, you can go almost all the way through a piece without blowing out the other side. So that ability to go in at a very shallow angle, if you're doing, you know, uh, say, uh, rails in the sides of a chair arm that slope back quite dramatically, to go almost all the way through a tin piece and have a very low chance of splitting it out. Um, makes these very popular with chair makers. The, um, this bit, you can still buy these new old stock. I can't remember the website name right off the top of my head, but if anyone's interested, hit me up later and I'll tell you where to buy them. They run about 20 pounds a piece, I think, to buy them. They come with the wax still on. They are genuine new old stock. Uh, well, we go, how are we doing on time? I'm gonna quickly run through a few oddities and fun things. Uh, one is that you can get depth, depth stops for these things. This is my favorite model. I believe it's the 49 by Stanley. When you hit depth, this little spring will just start boinging off the side of your work, which is always fun to watch. Um, the second kind of common Stanley depth stop is this guy, which actually screws on to the twist in the bit and it has solid feet which in a way is an advantage. You're more likely to hit right where you want. But in another way, it's a disadvantage in that you might mar the work if you're really getting into it when you get there. Um, what else? You can get Forstner bits for a brace, which leave very nice, very nice flat bottom holes. If you see ones like this, where the rim is completely continuous, there's no gap at all in the sides and there's no point at all in the center. Keep them, sell them to a collector and go get yourself some more recent ones. Where's the more recent one here? I have it sitting here somewhere. So this is what you want as a user. You want those side holes because they help with ejecting waste. You want that little point that will help you start it more accurately. And this is a far more pleasant tool to use in practice. So if you come across those, take them, sell them off to somebody who collects brace bits, take the money and get way more of these and you'll be far happier with them. These are really useful when you want to excavate waste for a large mortise because they're not going to, you know, other than a few little dimples from the point at the bottom, they're going to leave you a nice flat bottomed hole. They're also rim guided. They follow the rim. That little point is not what guides the bit, it's the rim, which means you can overlap holes quite easily. As long as you have enough surface for the rim to register, one hole can go over the other, can go over the other. Um, 
And then you have lots of other weird and wonderful things that can go in a brace. You can get socket drivers. You can get the really old school socket drivers. You can get countersinks. You can even get a countersink with its own built-in depth stop for consistency. You can get extraordinarily long bits that were generally used by shipbuilders and people running cable and everything else that will go to quite some depth. If that's not long enough for you, you can get a bit extension that this will lock into and take it to a really crazy length. I have three or four of these bit extensions, and yes, I did connect them all together once just to see if it would work, and it kind of does. I can pretty much drill a hole in the tree from across the garden. Uh, if a two jaw standard brace chuck isn't your thing, you can get a three jaw chuck that will go in your brace. Um, what else is fun? These guys are kind of cool. This is called a spoke pointer. Uh, they come in various sizes. That's kind of normal. This guy's kind of huge. And what they will do is you drop them on a squarish piece of wood and they'll put a point on the end. And the reason for the point on the end is usually to drop a tool like this on it, which is basically a rotary plane that goes in your brace. You drop that on the point and it will cut you a nice round tenon all the way down. Um, I have two of these that are two different variants of adjustable. You could also buy them in single sizes. This guy you can set to, oh, this guy you can set to whatever size you want. This guy has pre-arranged holes. I've found these good on soft wood and infuriating on hardwood. I don't know if it's the models I've got or if I haven't done a great job of setting them up. But when I tried to do beach with these, it was a living nightmare. Pine, absolute laugh. Walnut was okay, but beach was a nightmare. Um, for those of you who might be Christopher Schwartz fans and planning on doing some tenon furniture at some point in time, you can get reamers to ream out those holes for when you've got a tenon. This is a vintage reamer. It's a fairly straightforward tool. You stick it in the hole, it starts to ream it to the shape. And this is a modern reamer from Veritas, which actually allows the blade to be removed with those little nuts, which means you can shift it in and out a little bit to tune for harder softwood and away you go. Um, and the last thing, and the thing I probably use my brace for as much as drilling holes, is, uh, where did I put it? Veritas sell a little hex adapter. And I can take any standard hex bit out of and stick it in. And this makes for a absolutely magnificent screwdriver. The amount of power you can get out of a brace in one of these is crazy. I've had screws that have been stuck that I cannot budge with any other screwdriver. I'll grab a brace, I'll put this in it, and I get it moving in seconds. And yet again, that's not limited to any particular type of screw. You've also got the old classic screwdrivers that are designed to go in a brace. You have split nut drivers. If you're looking for something to take the split nuts off a saw, I've probably got a dozen of these in all different sizes at this point. And I think if you're concerned about um, exerting too much power while using something like that on an old saw, I think I have it out here somewhere. You can get little handles to operate your brace bits, which are really great for the smaller brace bits. And I have mislaid it this very second. And if you're finding a job is far too much work with the brace itself, you can get T-handles that you can mount your brace spits in with the same kind of a chuck. This is very good for when you need to be absolutely straight. It's much easier to keep a bit completely level than a large bit with this gun. Um, and then I think I will finish off with my favorite little bit from my collection at the moment, which is cock plug bit. This was used by sellermen to drill open a barrel before they put a tap in. It's basically a center bit, but as it breaks through, it plugs its own hole. So you've time to go get your tap and avoid wastage. And that's a very common feature with, um, with center bits. There are lots of weird and wonderful variants. This is a counterbore bit. It's designed to follow an existing small hole to make another hole that you put a plug in to conceal it. Used to conceal nails, screws, various fasteners. Used a lot in decking for boats and the like. I've seen a variant of this with an extra layer out with a depth stop. It's quite small and it was a custom designed bit 
for boring out the um, the nuts for hand saws. And um, there's there's literally no end to the weird and wonderful bits out there that you can find. Um, and I think we've been going for about 50 minutes. I think at this point, I better stop and see if anyone wants to ask any questions. So thank you all very much. Wonderful, Sean. Oh, absolutely amazing. Love that. Um, there, we are. there we go. Um, thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm going to remind everyone and anyone who's not joined before that if you want to ask Sean any questions, um, to stick your name in the chat. And I will go through and I'll do my best to spotlight you in turn. Um, so let me just see. I need to go back to the chat. And this is where, and people that know how to do this know fine well this isn't as easy as it looks. Um, I'm going to add Spotlight. Is that Sean and Paul on screen? There we go. It so is, first up is Paul. Um, over to you, Paul. Fabulous talk, Sean. Thank you very much, and thanks for showing your amazing bits to us all. You're welcome. Now, the question is, what steel are the bits actually made out of? That's a great question that I have no answer to. Um, I would say from filing them, it's something similar to the kind of steel you'd find in an axe or something like that. The material goes at around the, the same rate. Um, I'm no metallurgist, so I really can't tell you. I'm right, sorry. Yeah, it's just thinking of a potential use to recycle the actual, because obviously the bits eat end the life. Mm. It'd be nice to sort of like chuck it off to somebody who can do something with them. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there's, uh, I, I've gotten a fairly good eye at this point for kind of eyeballing a lot of bits on eBay and telling how far gone they are or not. Um, I don't really buy an awful lot. I wind up trashing. You probably noticed on some of the bits I have earlier on, there's like color coding on them with tape. If it's red, that means I couldn't get it to cut soft wood or hardwood. If it's red and yellow, that means I could get it to cut soft wood, but I couldn't get it to cut hardwood. So whenever I try a bit and it doesn't work the way I want, I grab the tape and I label it. If I need it again, I'll go back and give it a try fixing it up. And then after a few tries, I haven't managed. I just chuck them. Um, there's no shortage of these. These were made right up to the 60s, maybe even the 70s. I'm not really sure. Like Clico only stopped making those spoon bits uh, not too long ago. There's still one or two modern manufacturers. You're, you're not, by and large, depriving the world of a rare tool, particularly with a standard twist auger. Maybe some of the others. I mean, there's, there's not many of these guys around. Um, I wouldn't never throw that away, no matter how beat up it was. But for the others, you're not really depriving anything. You can just chuck it in the trash. Okay, thanks very much. I'll let other people ask a question. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. Yeah, and uh, next up we have, I just removed Paul, sorry. There we go. Um, Mathis. Hi, yes. Mathis. Hi. Uh, thank you, Sean. That was uh, every bit as fascinating as I had expected it to be. So, so warmest <laughs> thanks to start with. A uh, couple of questions. The first one, you sort of touched upon it in your answer to Paul, namely that there are a couple of makers still making, uh, so there's fish in Austria making mm -hmm. uh, the Jennings pattern auger bits. And I think it's tools for working wood in Brooklyn are making spoon bits. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any opinion on them uh, and, and sort, sort of... Uh, I have never less compared to vintage stuff. Um, I haven't tried the fish bits. I'm, I'm yeah. way more interested in vintage bits than I am in anything made brand new. Um, I've heard that they're okay. I, you yeah. know, to be honest, there are a huge number of manufacturers in the old days. I mean, this, for example, is a Jennings pattern bit, but it's not made yeah. by Jennings. It's made by Rich. Yeah. The patents mm. expired well before these stopped being mm. useful tools. Yeah, and. I, I was wondering, you know, when I started building up quite a horde of these, was I going to see a, you know, a staggering difference in performance between one manufacturer over another? And the answer is no, no, I really don't. I get the no. odd bad bit, but it doesn't even seem to be consistent. Um, these are such a well understood tool now that I think, you know, a new manufacturer might have a bit of a learning experience, but essentially, if it looks like it's a decent bit, it probably is a decent bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
I haven't gotten to try one of the Gramercy spoon bits, but no. there are quite a lot of chair makers out there who are big fans of them. So I'm assuming they're a good tool. Yeah. Um, Lee Valley did spoon bits for a while as well, but they're not making them right now. No. Whether or not that will change after the pandemic or not, I don't know. No. I don't know of anybody making new center bits, but they're not a complicated design. I would imagine a competent blacksmith can probably make you a serviceable center bit. Yeah. Um, and I don't know of anybody making forstners with a braced tang. Um, one thing I would say is that um, a lot of different manufacturers claimed to make braces that worked well on round shanks. That's mm. true to a point. I find with yes. a large bit, it's just not really true for any of them. You want a tree jaw or a four jaw chuck to really cope with it. So if you grab a modern um, forstner bit and try and put it in your in a brace, even a tree jaw to a certain size, it's not going to be that great. You really do want ones made for a brace. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any other mon modern manufacturers off the top of my head that I've heard of. Um, no. And most of the unusual ones, like the bull nose, um, no one's making them anymore. No. Now, uh, I've got a sort of a quarter set or a half a set of the fish Jennings patterns. Nice. So they are they are the new ones. And they cut very nicely. Uh, you also you, you sort of touched upon that in your talk that if you put too much torque on on particularly a smaller bit, uh, it's quite easy to 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 actually bend bend it. Yeah. Um, like, I had that happen to me with these, and and I was wondering if that was poor quality or. But you're saying it's actually a feature. No, it, it, it's a it's a it's a matter of the sheer force. Like a ten inch brace is a powerful tool, and yes. you can put your whole body weight around it. A little thing of metal that, you know, that size, it's just a matter of time before it works. If you try and do deep holes or you try and do particularly hard wood, yes. um, I would say fifty percent of the number four, the quarter inch bits that I find are bent. But like, if you look at one. There's one over here beside me. Like seriously, my body weight bent, you know, oh yeah, curling back and forth than that. It's it's significantly smaller than my little finger. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Um really in practice, I probably will never use this bit. I will probably always grab a brad point and egg beater by the time I'm yeah. the whole lot small. Yeah. Uh and, and finally, do you have any favorite braces? Do you well? The yeah. and, I, and I'm deeply worried. I just broke one of them in the middle of the talk. Um, I'm very fond of the North Brothers Yankee bracelets. <laughs> um, really, nobody needs one of these. Every no. brace is a decent brace as long as yeah. it rotates. Um, what's nice about these is they're pretty much weatherproof. And I have a mm -hmm. workshop where. I was worried because I'd left some of these bits out last night. I organized everything ahead of time for the talk and I can see that some of them gathered rust overnight sitting here. This is completely unprotected in this workshop and looks like it looks right now. Um, yeah. It's bulletproof. Everything's sealed. The jaws are really solid. The ratchet is incredibly smooth. I do have to sometimes done some drilling um, that requires you to operate in a tight space and that ratchet really does matter. Sometimes if I want to drill really straight, I'll use the ratchet as well, because if you're not swinging from side to side, if you're just doing that and you're trying to be really careful, that can help there as well. So that's, I've got three of these. I've got an eight inch, a 10 inch and a 12 inch. Uh, and I also have the bizarre creature that is the wimble brace. Yeah. Uh, if anyone who can, drill straight with one of these things, I take my hat off to you because you are operating both hands in this countermounting action, but it's incredibly powerful. If you're really trying to drive a heart, I, I, I will start the hole usually with something else until I get a certain depth and I'll unchuck it, stick this on top. And then there's very little this can't cope with. It is an incredible, um, you basically get to turn with both arms at once. You don't want to use this with anything other than a, uh, a bit with a snail because if the bit isn't pulling itself into the wood you're not going to be able to really push down no um so i've got four of their braces there's one or two out there i think they did a 14 um there's rumors that there are six inch ones out there but i've never seen one i can no. get the wood but i i like these but really 
any old brace where the jaw will hold the bit does the job yeah. is pure luxury because I'm a bit of a bit and brace geek. No one yeah. needs to spend money on one of these. Right. Okay. Thank you ever so much. I'll uh, let the next thank uh, you. person get thank you, get, a, get a word in edgewise. Thank you, Matthias. There we go. Over to you, Bill. Hi, Will. No, you're muted, Mel, sorry. There we go. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening. Hey, thanks. This was interesting. I didn't think I'd learned so much. I'm glad um, you enjoyed it. The one thing I was wondering is you uh, you talked about the Forstner bits for the, the braces. I've got standard um, hexagonal Forstner bits for them that I've been using on my drill press. Are they suitable for the brace? I've tried it. Difference? Um, there is there are some small differences in geometry. Um, some of the modern ones have a sawtooth that's quite difficult to start in a brace yeah. around the bottom. Um, I have a modern set that I haven't opened in quite some time now, but before I got these, I tried them. I found them very hard to start. They're really designed for a drill press. So a lot of the modern ones don't have as big a point if they've got any point at all, which makes it quite hard to start straight down with a hand brace. And um, these really old uh, original pattern ones, I can't start those with a, in a hand brace accurately either. Um, it's worth a try is probably the answer. And um, before you went out, you bought anything else. If your if you um if your brace will hold it, you'll probably need a tree jaw brace or an adapter like this little guy I showed off earlier. Go into your brace just to get it to hold it. Um, but I'd certainly give it a shot before I went out and I tried to hunt these down because it will take you a while to get a set of these. Yeah, um, I, got, I got a three uh, the Veritas or Lee Valley three, three chuck brace. But I've also got the square one, which was my grandfather's, and a bunch of his bits. And some of them aren't in very good shape, but some of them work okay. You, you'd be surprised um, how many bits that look awful, given a light sharpens, turn out to work just great. Um, like yeah. very, there are I I, tr I give up on relatively few bits, um, not because I'm persistent, but because I'm usually happily surprised by how quickly they shape up. Um, if this is something you're hunting for, or any of the unusual bits. The bad news is you won't find them by searching for them by name on eBay. Or if you do, the price will be extortionate. The best way to find them is just make yourself a good cup of coffee and set aside an hour to looking at random lots of auger or brace bits on eBay. And you'd be surprised what you find in there because the average person on eBay has no idea what these things are called. I've changed what I thought some of these bit types were called several times in my head as I've learned over the years because there's very little... Um, there's differences in US and UK terminology. Uh, you know, I thought a sh I thought a shell bit was a spoon bit for a long time until I, I learned a little better and that kind of thing. So the best way to get these is to just page through several hundred listings until you spot one peaking out of a row. Well, thank you. You're I've never thought thought of using um, the um, like um, the drill attachment for my bits, putting it into the the hex. The, the three three um three job brace and using it to undo a screw. I'll try that next time. I got a tough one. Thing. It, you're you're going to be amazed. But a, a ten inch brace, as, as long as the bit you really really want to make sure that the bit you put in it works mm -hmm. properly because it's the right size. Because you will strip it in a heartbeat. But as long as it's a good fit, you can get some incredible power. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Bo. Um, next we have Daryl. Hey, Daryl. There we go. Nice talk. That was good. Uh, looks you. like you have more bits than I do. <laughs> I, I got a, there's two little cabinets under my bench and they're just full of two rolls of bits. It's, it's a great so, way to weigh down your bench. My bench does not move. So I was going to ask, do you, do you store your, your miscellaneous bits? Like they're not the box sets. Do you store them in rolls or trays? Yeah. Um, my, I mean, often you're good, quite lucky and it comes with a nice old roll, something like that. But what I buy is, um, if you go on a lot of the cheap Asian websites, you can get very cheap chef knives tool rolls or bonsai tool rolls. You can get these for a few bucks a piece. And I don't know how many I have now, but every time I buy a lot of bits, I tend to jump over and buy a roll so they'll arrive at about the same time. And it's quite a compact way to store them without them all banging off each other. 
so I just have stacks of these sitting in the one shelf. Um, I the the bits I use the most live at the top of the stack. The bits uh, I use the most sit in a block of wood on top of the the shelf near the braces. Nice. I have I have one bit stock tool I didn't see you waving around. I used it just the other day to to cut some threads on some. Oh, nice! I did not have one of them. This thing takes uh, a standard one inch tap or sorry die. That is fantastic. I've and never seen it, one of those before. It really helps you keep it your 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 threading straight on to the stock because you have so much length to work on it. That's I I, I found that thing in a, a dealer's junk box at a tool sale and it was like just a couple of bucks and I'm like, oh, I know what that's for. I'm I'm insanely jealous. That's a wonderful. Yeah. Tool. I've never seen another one. It's a it, and me, I've used it several times. It's great. Me either. Um, that that's a first for me. I've, I've never even heard of them before. Yeah. But uh, where I lived, there used to be a shipbuilding industry, and I find lots of these ship augers. A lot of them have um, no snail at all. Yeah, that's called um, barefaced. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, bare, barefoot auger. Yeah. Reason for that is you that have to the, use a gouge to, to cut a, a divot before you start. Well, the reason for that is um, the snail um, can deflect a bit when it hits really dense patches of wood or a knot or something like that. So if you want to bore really deep, i.e., you don't know what you're going to run into, and it's important that it goes straight, then they preferred the burr face over because there was less chance of the snail kind of trying to work its way around an obstacle. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. I've got one or two of those sitting right here somewhere. All right, thanks. It was a, that was a that was a good talk. That was neat. Sorry about <laughs> your race. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll I'll check it in a minute when I mean, I've got yeah. time. Hopefully it's not. I just did something silly and it's not actually broken. Thanks. Thanks, Daryl. Um, over to Andy. Thanks, John. It's a great talk. I agree with everything you said. Um, really nice to to hear it said so sensibly. You know, like sorting out the mix up that people get in between the different types. Um, I thought I'd try and contribute by oh, showing please. something that you hadn't. And I thought, oh, I'll get out some dowling bits. You won't have those. Yep, you have one. <laughs> I'll get out a little um, square shank uh, Forster bit and a big one. Oh, and you know, you've oh, got yeah. those. They're the modern stuff from 1900 or so. Um, but it, that is a big one, though. I don't think I got one that large. Um, that's, hang on, uh, inch and a half. Yeah, I, I, I don't have one over an inch. Made in America, PM Company, which is the Progressive nice. Manufacturing Company. Um, <laughs> you had um, the countersinks for doing bolts. I thought they were quite unusual. But, uh, yeah, not very, yeah. They're not easy to come by. No, I only got two. Um, but I thought I'd show you my two, if I can take a couple of minutes, my two favourite odd auger, um, brace attachment things. Um, that's a, a fairly unusual one, but I think the Americans here will recognise it. It's a Miller's Falls production. I have no idea. It takes the idea of the little hand vice and just adds more and more to it. So it's a vice for holding things in. You can do up the wing nut, tighten the thing that you're filing or sawing or whatever, grip it in your hand, work on it steadily. So far, so ordinary. And of course, the handle unscrews and you can take bits, little bits. Sorry, I'm doing this left to right again. It's hard, isn't it? Um, little bits out the handle. But one thing this includes is this sort of treble cutter arrangement, three little bits. Oh, nice. You put that in the top and because that then becomes a thing that will cut a leather washer. Very nice. You've got a spike to center it and two cutters at different distances to do the hole in the middle and the outer rim. I have a, I have a similar um, but, tool. Uh, yeah, um, but you don't want to be doing it by hand. Yeah, and this uh, these were this had a different cutter you could put in it that would cut um, circular holes and pipes and metal tanks and the like. Yeah, galvanized water tanks up in the loft, that sort of thing. But 
what you do, you take the wooden handle off and you put in the brace adapter. Oh, lovely. And then, if you really don't mind all the extra bits sticking out, you can hold it all in your brace and uh, knock out leather washers all day long. That's fantastic. It, it didn't cost me very much. I've seen them. They're not ever so uncommon on eBay, but the prices are all over the shop. You this can is pay a lot. You can pay a little. This is the problem. If somebody thinks they've got something unusual, they can ask for far too much. And other people yeah. think about grandpa's old junk and they'll sell you a wonderful roll of tools for a tenner. Yeah. And um, mine came without the brace bit. I had to make a spare for that. And then the other thing I'm proud of is a little mystery, which I managed to solve. This looks like a perfectly ordinary brace at first, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like Slightly a little old fashioned brace. wooden handles. Um, if I turn it around that way, you'll notice something that's not English about it. Well, that's, not a square. The... that's not a square hole on the end anyway. It's got those little notches. It's a dual standard. It's a square hole and a flat slot. Oh, that makes it pretty old. And over in our continental neighbouring countries, France, Germany, etc., they used to have auger bits that instead of a square taper had a flat tab this would take either but that's not why it's unusual and this won't show up on screen i don't expect but um there is some lettering on this there it is you can maybe just about make it out down here i could see that there is some but i can't see what it says it up on the top, it's got the French stuff that means um, not patented. You know, don't don't come crying to the government if it breaks. <laughs> um, and at the bottom, it's got this word amobrequin, A M O, B R E, Q U I N. Now, time was if you googled that, all you would find was a post on the old tools discussion list. There's somebody saying, I've got this funny brace that says a Mobraquin on it. I don't know what it means. No, nor do I, says somebody else. I haven't got a clue. Later on, the um, people at the Internet Archive started putting up scanned old books. And one of the old books that they uh, offered to the world is an old Michelin um, motorist's guide. And back in the early days of the Michelin guides, it wasn't just restaurants. It was also tires and help with your car and there was a little catalogue of car related tools and in just the same way that ikea nowadays give a name to each product michelin did the same it was quite a common thing at the time because it meant you could send a telegram saying send me an amobraquin immediately and you only paid for one word you didn't have to say um wheel brace with double adapter socket because that's what it is. It's oh. the brace bit. You take the, the socket, the nut driver socket that you showed us, that goes in with a nice extension bar. And then you, or probably your chauffeur would do it for you, can undo the wheel nuts to change your tyre and put a proper Michelin tyre on, like you should have done in the first place. That's so it. it's a lovely adaptation. It's a perfectly ordinary, you know, off the shelf French. Um, manual ratchet free brace but taken up by Michelin and sold through their special catalogue just for that purpose and, and of course it now you'll find my explanation on an online forum yeah. of, and uh, of course uh, uh, in, yeah. in, in French Ville Brequin is the word for a brace exactly, the, the words were, were not entirely random it was a little bit like the word and the other things on the same page are similar words. Yeah, it was a, a good system. And I've since found the same sort of thing in other um, tool catalogues for the same cheap telegram sort of reason. I'll stop there. There's so much you can say about braces and stuff. I, thought, I mean, I, I kind of had to Different pick bits. I'm, I'm far more interested in bits than braces, but if I had started to talk about braces tonight, I would have been done for it. There's no We'd way. We'd be there for a week. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd, one other slight thing, did you did you mention those at all? 
I think. I Swiss didn't. Uh, most Swiss people bits. ran out of time. Yeah. They're gimlet bits. Yeah. I yeah. noticed only tonight when looking out some to bring bring along. Mm -hmm. These are marked in millimeters. They're three, four, five on them. Oh. And they actually are millimeter sizes. That's interesting. Um, one of the things I love those for is um, pilot holes for cut nails and Roman nails. All oh, right, yeah. Because um, a lot of them are tapered, I think I have one around here somewhere that's a bit fatter than that that will show a little better. Where did I put it? Here we go. This guy's a bit bigger and meatier, so it's easier to see. Because there's a very distinct taper on the tip. Mm. Perfect pilot holes for cutting Roman nails. Yeah, that's and, a good point. Um, these can even do. These can even start more accurately on an angled hole than the spoon bits can, because once that tip is in, mm. you drop it quite dramatically and still drill. I would imagine. I've never tried it, but I'd imagine you do a decent job trying to do um, pocket holes with these. Um, yeah. But from my reading, that's mostly what these were for. They were mostly for. Um, they were mostly for pilot holes for fasteners, but like anything with these bits, there's an awful yeah. lot of controversy on everything. Oh, and I think, sorry, I will shut up, honest. Um, when you were talking about the centre bits and the advantages, mm -hmm. and, and you said a competent black, blacksmith can make them, that I think is the big one, isn't it? That they, they can be made to order yeah. if necessary, and they're cheap. Yeah. Because, you know, there's only, you know, what, half a dozen processes in making one. Whereas an auger bit, you know, you're up to about 30. Um, you need machinery and dies and yeah, and like, stuff. you can kind of find the transitional bits. This guy, for example, is basically a center bit with a snail. An improved center bit, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think Stanley saw, sold these under the Powerbore brand. So this basically took away, this kind of took away some of the advantages in that this will split wood when it's mm. the way a normal center bit would want. But you don't have to apply the downward Push. pressure while you're rotating. So if you just want a fast hole and you don't care, cheaper yeah. than a, a full-on auger. Yeah. Anyway, but you can see lots of sort of like bits that had intermediate features between the two. Some that only had one or two twists to let you get that bit yeah. to you clear some waste. Um, but yeah, the, the, they, I don't really bother with them. I'll either use an auger or I'll use one of these guys. Yeah. That's a lovely one, though. There's some right for my experience. Sorry. From my experience, showing that the shorter the, the twists on it were used in doors. So if you were born for a, a cylinder lock and mm -hmm. you didn't need to bore through a, a deep depth, you didn't need all those extra twists on it. So exactly. your, your 32 mil bit for your cylinder locks or your yield locks um, were only going through the width of um, 40, 45 mil for okay. a door. And it didn't need that long length, which only like complicated it. And if you were doing that all day, every day, you'd go through these bits. Like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to use a, a good auger to do that job because it's more expensive. Yeah. Um, there's some cool variants of these guys that have a second spur on the inside as well. When you get up to kind of the two and a half, three inch sizes, you tend to see that. This is two and a half, but only has one. Okay. Uh, thanks again for... Uh, oh, thank you, Andy. No problem, Andy. Uh, I like your second camera angle as well. That was interesting. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Stephen, here you go. One of the, uh, let's see, I'm not sure what's going on. There we go. Um, one of the interesting parts of the thread is you're able to count how many turns once you bite wood hmm. with the main, with the main um, uh, remover of the wood. The, the lifter of, of grain or whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's, let's go with the cutter. Yeah, the cutting yeah. edge. Once the cutting edge hits, and so that's what I'm, one of the things I'm teaching the children when we're doing public demonstrations is find a piece of waste wood and see how many times that you need to turn it before the, the nose breaks out on the other side. And that way you can get to a point where you just have a minute hole. You haven't even started lifting grain. So when you flip it over, you stick in the hole and finish it off. And it just makes life so much easier. Absolutely. 
And actually something I should have said earlier, um, it's a bad idea to let too much of the snail go through the board when you're doing that flip and redrill trick. Because if there's only a tiny bit of wood left, then you will tend to just break straight through with the once you put weight on the brace and it will lever up fiber to the side and make an awful mess. You really do want to go for just the tip point poking through. Yeah, and, and you can feel underneath when that when you get close because sometimes you know it's like a half stroke is a, is a major difference between how much of the snail that reach, uh, reaches the uh, the bottom mm -hmm. side of the wood um and the other thing on um shoot i just had a brain fart on the uh name of the the mortise the um forstner, forstner bit the pre what what they'll do, especially if they don't have the, a lead spike, is they will use a center bit or um, some form of bit and pre-drill the hole so that the hole's aligned. Then you can place in the Forstner bit and then you can go off in whichever way you want to go. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a good point. And one of the things I love about having a wide range of bits is I will often start a hole with one tool and then switch to the other yeah, tool yeah, when I want. Yeah. Um, when you've got those options, you can do things that would be a, a total pain. Otherwise, I'm when I was doing the end grain boring with center bits, I'd often get the hole started with a standard one because it's easier to get it straight. And right. I'd switch to the center bit. It would be slow, but I'd have a good reference to start, start to get down and I wouldn't make as much, much of a mess of it. Um, like it really is there's a lot of jobs that are best done with two you know with two bits one to start and one to carry through right the other thing is the miller falls t handled mm -hmm. now you had a different one it looked like the clutch was in one of the handles mine is incomplete because um this side is supposed to have a removable handle right and it can spin off and screw into the top right and then that removable then, then handle you, is missing. You can crank you around your, and it will rotate in your hand. And because it has a ratchet, you can just go yeah, back and exactly. forth. You just keep cranking it back But and forth. I find that that is exceedingly great when you're going above an inch. If you're if you're down to a very you know, like an eight or ten inch um, radi uh, distance from center line on your handle. So mm -hmm. in other words, you don't have a 12 or a 14. Then one inch is that, that point where you shift over to the T handle. And you actually, it, it's easier to keep things square with the T yep. handle because you're like, already established in the hole and you just move on through. But, it's, uh, um, it's a sort of a speed versus accuracy trade-off is, is what I find. You can get the true faster with a brace, but you will... Um... You, it's much easier to see square, at least in one dimension with the T-handle. Right. And um, the, uh, now, when I say the one inch, it's one inch in pine is different than one inch in walnut or beech. And that's where that thread, the coarseness of the thread is so critical is never try to use a coarse in super hard woods they just want it spins its yeah. up i mean it'll spin itself out and the problem is if you um if you try if you then switch to the right bit because you've got that hole from the snail that's stripped out it's hard to get it to strip the um the bull nose and the gauge slash cut bits are actually a bit of a savior in that scenario because these will cut better in that case and they'll also self-center if you can expand an existing hole with these because the the round tip as you spin, it will tend to center itself in it, and it's good for enlarging hole. Yep. Anyway, it was a great talk. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a. It was like you're going through my collections because <laughs> <laughs> my stuff. My most of my bits are 1850 and older um, because of the nature of the demonstrations and the construction that I'm doing. And, but, you know, technology did not change that fast, except for a few things like the second, the chip breaker on planes mm. and, and going because the original Jennings bits did not have a screw. 
they had from the center point, they had a center point and I've got a few of those. And so then, because the problem is, is cutting tapered screws does not become factory ability or you can't mass produce them uh, until after 1856. From 1856 on, you start to see the advent of tapered screws. You can, you'll see tapered screws before that, but they were hand cut. Gotcha. I'd love to see a picture of one of those bits sometime. I've never seen one. Yeah, I'll have to find one. It's, I have so many tools and I don't store them out in the open. They're all in rolls and bags. And I, I spent a lot of time digging out the bits I wanted to have around for tonight, just going through roll after roll. Now you got to put them away. <laughs> oh, that'll be, that'll be another week. Well, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. It was really thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Over to you, Eric. Eric. Hi, Sean. That, that, that was that was really really interesting. It's a, a rabbit hole I've I've always sort of peered in from a distance, but I've never gone down. I've got a, a nice a nice box of uh, Irwin bits. That I've got oh, a, a set 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 C, which is good. Nice. They're all they're all in very good. I'm probably going to tip out for trying to show them up. They're all in very good very good condition. Uh, and it goes up to it goes up to an inch. There's another bit at the at the bottom that opens out that's got longer ones in it. Yeah, up to an inch an inch wide, which is good. They all seem to be in very good nick. I've used a few of them and they cut like a dream. They're really nice. Uh, I got myself a file in case I had to sharpen them, but I've not had to yet. But another thing I got was this. This is, a, this is a, I think it's a sort of user-made box because it's pretty scrappy. Oh, but I know what I thought I thought this was uh, where are we? I thought I thought this was an expansion bit because it, it kind of looks like it, but there's a difference in height between the cutter here mm -hmm. and and the cutter there, and I'm not sure how that, I've never had to use this, so I'm not sure how it works. That probably illustrates it even better. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got I've got a longer a longer bit so that can, can go is, in as well. This is basically a bit like a center bit, in that you've got a single cutter and a single wing. Um, and yeah, yeah. the cutter on this one, they usually came with two cutters, a short and a long. Yours looks oh, like it has the short in it. Yep. This yep. is long. Um, and they typically went up to about a three inch hole. And um, the thing with them is you really have to tighten up that screw like right. as hard as you possibly can because what will happen as you um as you cut is the wing tries to kind of pull the bit out a bit and you can wind up in an unfortunate position where the bottom of the hole is wider than the top of the hole and uh, if you're not planning on going all the way through uh, that's going to be a bit of a challenge to get back out again you'll, you'll get there by wiggling uh, it back and forth but it's yeah. a real thing um these are great. They're not, I don't like them as much as a center bit. Um, they're quite aggressive. They need a, a big brace to turn with uh, the, um, they don't take a gentle little cut, or at least this one doesn't. It takes a very big, deep bite once it gets down. But they do work, um, and you can set them to whatever width you want. Um, same rules as, as a standard auger. You know, you don't want to go all the way through. You want to get just the tip out. Uh -huh. um, they're, they're nice tools. They're very handy. I've used this a few times. Um, they're not as nice to use as a dedicated bit for the size, but they're great to have yeah. around for odd yeah. sizes. Oh, well, right. Uh, I haven't, I've, never, I've never had to use it. This, the, the, the larger bit is very blunt there. So should that be sharpened? Um, yeah. I mean, it's the same as the other one. You'll see that it's kind of got a... Uh, a sweep and curve to it. I would sharp. I would come in with a, an auger bit file at an angle. Uh, oh. put my file down. I don't know. It's in the middle of all these bits now. But I would kind of come in and sweep from the underneath, and it will probably only take a pass or two to to oh, get it sharp nice. enough. If you look at most of these bits, right, they're not uh, that sharp. You're not going to cut yourself on them. No, uh, they don't. They don't need to be shave your arm sharp the way a plain blade needs uh -huh. to be because you're not going for a finished surface with these most of the time it's just scooping the fibers up after these wings have severed it so um i would even just try it before i even bother to take a file to it like i said uh, 
lifetime on it on these is not that great if you're sharpening them a lot so uh -huh. i tend to sharpen only when they're not working at all really to, yeah no that's that sounds like sounds like solid advice yeah i mean i say i've I, it was one of these things that i saw it and thought oh you know i'd like one of those and i bought it yeah. no, it wasn't it wasn't cheap it wasn't um, dear at all uh and you know but i've never i've never had a, a, a use for it you know i've got bigger bigger bits and things that i'll drill lots of small holes and file them out and things but i right. no no that's that's great so th thanks very much thank you, thank you. It's just a, you know it's 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 another thing all of these bits of our our craft you know you can you can go down it in huge amounts of detail and i i just find it all fascinating it's Life's just too short i'm never going to know everything <laughs> yeah i just if i see a lot of bits on ebay and i don't know what one of them is i just get this uncontrollable twitch in that finger and next thing you know a parcel's arriving uh, that's it. it does it's got life of its own <laughs> my fault i can't control it. yep i'll try that excuse my wife next time <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Eric. How are you doing, Richard? Good evening, Sean. Um, oh, uh, Eric, Eric has just beaten me to it. I was going to talk about these um, expanding bits, but uh, the, the, the discussion has just been just being held. Oh, so, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really have have much to add. So the, the larger is a snell, and mm -hmm. and, the, and the smaller is a, is a ridgeway. The, it's hard way, hard to see maybe, but the, the Ridgeway one under the there's this um, this plate held down with a screw that's, that that mm -hmm. stops it sliding, and it's um, it's kind of serrated or, or toothed so that um, uh, lock in ho hopefully that will that will resist that effect that you were talking about where where it uh, it slips as you as you make the hole. Um more or less but not not uh, not guaranteed the problem no. isn't so much that the problem isn't so much that as the force causing the slew to slacken and then it might skip a little bit yeah um so i would I, I would always be careful and i wouldn't if i was going deep i'd back out now and again and check the width yeah of what i said of that yeah I, th I think these two haven't been used very much because they they cut quite well and 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 the screw um slot isn't is not chewed up yeah they look they look new old stockish to me. They don't look like they've had a hard life at all. Yeah, the, the big the big um, one was rusty, but it 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 didn't actually need much um, much sharpening to make. They're a bit like the combination plane of the the auger bit world in that they didn't get used that often because for most of the common sizes you'd have a dedicated bit, so people would yeah. break them out now and again for the weird hole. So they, yeah. they tended not to have um, hard lives, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you also showed one of these. Oh, yes. Well, that looks... Oh, oh, that's way better than mine. Nice. So this, this is a, this is a, um, a chuck from a, from a burnt-out uh, electric drill. Oh, uh, and this is a, uh, an adapter I made. Do you know, Richard, I just realised it was you, but I think I remember reading the forum post where you originally put that up when you made it years ago. Yeah. Very yeah. nice work. Yeah, so it's yes, yeah, it's a very handy thing because you, you can you can use use it to drive all all sorts of things such as um, such as modern forceness and hole saws and and so on. Another option set there is Veritas sell a square drive to go on a brace. Okay, and you can buy chucks that will that square drive will just go straight into. Yeah, um, and who is it? Garrett Wade, I think, in the US sells uh, what they call their versatile brace and. It actually is a square drive brace with a chuck on it. Yeah, it's got a range of chucks for it, which is a nice tool as well. But I've never gotten around to getting one. But I've been I I remember that um your forum post on making that is what made me hunt down a tree jaw adapter for my brace. Okay, yeah, pretty good. And um, oh, that's a that a what, what a, a disc cutter. It's a, it is, it's a it's a leather washer cup uh, um it's, it's a, a yeah it's a big one yeah yeah it's a, it, it's marples and I, I i i i didn't know what it was but i i had a look in an, in an old marples catalog of about 1930 something or other and it's yeah it's described as a leather washer cutter 
very nice. Well, I don't, I don't have much use for cutting leather washers, but uh, if I ever need a big one, then... If you ever then... need a leather washer, I know who to call. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Excellent, Mitchell. Okay. Just... Oh. That, that would that would just be just be the thing for the leather washer cutter. Would be just the, just the thing for uh, a, a village pump. So mm -hmm. right yeah. here, my yeah. my father-in-law when he was in the boys' brigade as a boy was in uh, Iona um, on, a, on a camp, and the the pump to get water out had been broken. And so he took the tongue out of an old pair of shoes and cut a washer and repaired the pump for it. And the guy, the guy that owned the campsite, was extremely grateful. So that's just <laughs> a, a story of no account. But you know, leather washers. If you need a big one, that's that's the thing you need. Uh, so I think he just did it with a pen knife. But <laughs> yeah, um, good, yeah. I'm so glad you brought that, Richard, because that was the that was the style of tool I was looking to show as a as a nice way to to use the um, the split nut wrench on an old saw, but mine has vanished off my bench, which I'm quite alarmed at because I saw one going to Stanley auctions for about 120 130 pounds the other day. Have I lost you, Richard? Hello, you no? still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. gorgeous it's modeled after the preston right it is yes yeah yours you is that one nice. yes, that's something you made richard it is yeah nice um the little screw on the end you can just undo that pop the auger out pop in another and if you want to use small auger bits by hand for delicate work it's fantastic i have i have a uh, one of the preston ones i was going to show it alongside that but i seem to have misplaced it and they're beautiful tools. Richard's is way nicer than the original. You can just pop the hey, envelope anytime yeah. you like, Richard. I'll take care of it for you. Yeah. So that's my contribution for this evening. Thank you, Sean. For... Oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. I'm just going to remove the, the spotlight, Sean, go back to gallery. There was actually a question in the, ch in the chat from Tim, and this might be open to you, Sean, first, but I'm not saying you don't know this, but and that was... How would you straighten a bit that has come out of true? So if you actually got like a thin bit that was bent, is there any way to straighten it? Don't have a good answer. I have one or two that I, I'm, I'm going to try and find that out with at some stage, but I, I don't know of a good way. If anyone else here does, please. Does anyone else have any tips on straightening bits? Uh, what I did when I bent one of mine, but I mean, I'm not recommending this because this was, this was really Heath Robbins, and I basically kept it in the brace the same way it had been bent, and I, I just used force in the other direction until I got it reasonably straight, because that gave me holding it in the brace and 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 keeping it in the hole, where you know I had been drilling a hole, it bent in the process. I bent it back while it was still in the hole, and with the brace on it, I got sufficient leverage that that I could do that. I'm not saying that that's a good idea, but that's how I did it. Yeah. I've done it that way too. So you Andy, heard Andy, like to make it question, Andy? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in all the uh, excitement about other things, I remembered the third thing that I was going to show if there was time. But yeah, if we run out of questions and we sort of keep it going, um, was if you've got one of those. I do. If you ever need Wonderful to gadgets. work around a corner. Um, I've never needed to drill a hole around a corner, but I couldn't <laughs> resist buying it just because it was such a lovely gadget. They are they are wonderful things. And um, because it's patented by Mr. Quimby. I think it's Augustus Quimby in memory. Um, so not only has it got the, the bit to go in your brace, it's got a, an unusually good chuck at the other end uh, with a pair of jaws that are more effective than some at gripping and um, and there's all sorts of, of weird brace designs out there like you've got this machine gun looking fella oh I've never, yes i've never even handled one of those these are designed to go right into a corner this flat piece would brace against the wall yeah and then you could with it flush against the walls you can crank this part around and get your corner hole in 
Yeah. It's designed for it's designed for getting right up against the wall and drilling and using the wall as a reference at the same time. Um, so there are some really wacky braces out there. And then there's a thing a bit like that that's got a, a wheel brace on as well that's as the ordinary crank brace, isn't it? I'm not fortunate enough to have one, but I've even seen uh, a brace and egg beater in one type device. That's, that's what I mean, yeah. Um, and then the more standard corner brace for a tight spot is something like this guy. Which is just uh, yeah, yeah. a crank and a handle and away you go. It's a skinner. And then the really weird, I should have actually taken this out for tonight. You've got the chain brace attachment. Oh, the drilling holes in pipes. Exactly. You wrap the chain yeah. around the pipe, feeding it over the other side. <laughs> and as you drill, this, this extends itself. So it keeps the pressure on. So it's for drilling into a round object. So you typically put a metal cutting bit and you chuck at the end and put the other end into your brace. There's loads of, basically, I see something like this on the I have to buy it for me. <laughs> and if the children are getting steadily skinnier, that's that's just how it is. Well, just get them, you know, exercise boring holes in things. Exactly. Build them up. Well, and there is a problem, isn't there? Is there? Dust is roughage in the diet. Do, do you find it frustrating that you don't need very many holes in ordinary woodwork? Um, I've gone down a few rabbit holes in woodwork that I actually did wind up boring a lot of holes. I make a lot of tool holders because I'm a tool hoarder. Um, as I said earlier, when I was making my moxen vice, I wanted to see, I was using one and a half inch um, wooden screws that I made. Mm. So I was boring large holes in hardwood. That's how a lot of this collection started. I don't have a lathe. So when I went to make the handles for the wooden screws, I actually took larger stock um, but not much larger than the screw and drilled holes down into those handles through end grain figuring out how to do that without splitting it is where a lot of this bug got started and everything else um it's a bit like you know to a man with a hammer everything looks like a nail to a man with a large brace bit connection uh, collection mm. everything looks like it could use a few more holes in it. I think that's a good takeaway slogan for tonight. Everything yeah. use a few more holes in it. I think so I next you will be applying for a job in Switzerland, eh? Exactly. I heard there's some cheese factories who could use a man like me. I think on that note, I think we'll finish tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, thank you. That was an, an excellent demonstration and talk. I loved every second of it. So I'm going to say from everybody here, thank you. Uh, now's the time to raise a glass, everybody, and say um, cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Sean on the bench. Sean on the bench. Sean. Sean. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. You're welcome.